We will now move on to our fourth speaker, Dr. Vanessa Wong, who's a soil scientist and senior lecturer in soil and land management at Monash University. She spends her spare time cycling in Melbourne and around regional Victoria. And she says that this is great as a soil scientist because it means you can look at the expo exposed soil profiles on road cuttings as you ride by and see how they change. Which, in my background in medicine, would be probably the equivalent of going to the beach and watching people swim by. <laughs> she, likes, she likes to think that that's the reason why she's, she is slow at riding up hills. <laughs> Vanessa. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to thank Laboratory for helping us celebrate International Year of Soils. So happy Yay! International Year of Soils. Um, <laughs> and while I've got your attention, you should also mark in the 5th of December, which, is, which also happens to be World Soils Day. So um, keep that in mind. Um, normally, I have about 12 weeks to tell my students how fascinating it is studying soils. Um, unfortunately, I don't have quite as long tonight, but hopefully by the end of tonight, you'll also um, see how you'll also see how awesome soils are. Maybe just a little bit awesome, anyway. Um, so, soil science is really an interesting uh, discipline, largely because it integrates all of the traditional, what we would consider traditional. Um, disciplines of science. So you can study soils in the realm of soil physics, soil biology, and soil chemistry. And so tonight, the soil scientist that I'm going to talk about was actually originally trained as a soil chemist. And his name was Justus von Liebig. And it's his contributions to soil science and also science today that allows Australia to be the powerhouse in terms of agricultural productivity that it is today. His discoveries back in the 19th century still permeate through soil science in terms of its research and what we try and understand today. And it, he's still, his, his studies still um, permeate through those, um, those, the, the current research, such as the efficient use of fertilisers, the use and reuse of waste products, and, and the use of compost on, on agricultural land. So von Liebig was um, slightly older than some of the other soil scientists slightly older than some of the other scientists that we've heard about tonight. He was born back in 1803 in Germany. Um, and his father was a dealer in drugs and colours. So this took me a little while to work out what exactly drugs and colours were. But it's assumed that the chemical processing in terms of the production of both pharmaceuticals and also paints and varnishes, um, which sort of implies that the colours part, um, excited the young von Liebig which sparked his initial interest in chemistry. So as a young scientist, he studied in Germany at the University of Bonn, and then through other, throughout Europe in other European universities. And during his studies, he actually crossed paths with a number of um, uh, important, I guess, other famous scientists. So this included um, Louis Pasteur, who he had a bit of a um, spat with later on in his career. But also, he crossed paths with um, a scientist by the name of Alexander von Humboldt. And his work on biological geography eventually laid the foundations of what we now understand is, um, as the modern discipline of, of biogeography. So von Humboldt was actually quite impressed by, by Liebig's early work. And he actually um, recommended Liebig to a, a colleague of his, of his, uh, his good friend, a guy or a scientist called Gay Lussac. And he was a world leading chemist at that time. Liebig had decided to, to study under the, um, under the tutelage of, of Galicic, and he learnt a great deal in terms of um, pure chemistry from him. And it was here, under his tutelage, that it was reported that when the two of them actually finished quite a difficult analysis or quite a difficult study together, that Gay Lussac would then take him by the hand and they would dance together around a laboratory table. I'm not really sure I would have continued in my discipline had my supervisor done that to me. <laughs> anyway, so Liebig's work can actually be uh, divided into two periods. He was, as I was saying, a, a chemist by, by trade. So his earlier period focused primarily on pure chemistry. His later career was then focused on, on applied chemistry. And this is what we'll actually focus on. 
His key contributions to soil science were identifying the sources of carbon and other essential trace elements in terms of plant growth. Plant nutrition is actually is, is really important and it's still important now in terms of um, improving crop growth, improving pasture growth, and also in terms of ensuring food, food security for, for a growing population. The prevailing theory at the time in, in the 1800s was that humus, organic matter, or, um, or black soil was essential for, for plant growth. We know it's essential for plant growth now, but it was essential for plant growth back in the 1800s largely because it imparted a vital life force to, to plants, and this could, not be, um, this could not be derived from inorganic chemicals. So it was then assumed that plants derive their carbon um, from, from soil or from, from humus or from its organic matter. And this theory was largely based on the well-known uh, well observation that virgin soil or the soil that, um, that was observed from recently cleared and highly productive forest land was incredibly black and was incredibly fertile. So by that line of reasoning, then surely, um, then surely plants could derive carbon from that particular black soil. Liebig saw a few gaps in that, um, in that observation and he questioned this theory. Humus was clearly, humus or organic matter is clearly the product of plant decay. So how on earth could these first plants on earth ever become established if humus was necessary for the plants to establish? So it brought up this idea of the chicken and egg um, conundrum. So as any good scientist did, he tested his hypothesis. His, his first hypothesis in this particular area was that the carbon used by plants is extracted from the atmosphere rather than the soil humus. Um, and so this idea was based on his observations that in any particular piece of land where the area remained constant, plants continued to grow. And as plants grew, the amount of carbon that was held in the plants increased, but the carbon held in the soil didn't um, essentially remain static or, or, or close to static. So the other observation he made as plants grew was that the given area of land didn't actually increase. So there was this carbon that was increasing in the plants, but the carbon in the soil was essentially the, the same. So to test this idea, Liebig, like all good scientists, started experimenting with plants. He took charcoal, which is essentially an inert form of carbon, so relatively unreactive, um, ground it up and planted some plants in it. And he observed his plants and looked at them for, for a little while. And amazingly, they grew. So you have these plants growing in this relatively inert form of carbon. And this led him to the conclusion that if a plant grows in charcoal, which potentially um, could not actually take up, which provides a car form of carbon that the plants could not take up, then the carbon must be coming from somewhere else, it must be coming from the atmosphere. And so he effectively overthrew what was then understood as, as the humus theory. So whereby the plants primarily took up uh, carbon from, from the soil, he effectively proved that plants took up carbon from, from the atmosphere. He didn't actually understand the, the entire process, but he did um, prove that, that it didn't come from the soil. So in his investigations in terms of identifying how plants um, interacted with, with the soil, he looked further in, into, this, um, into this line of study. And so what he did was he took a lot of plants um, which, which grew in a range of different types of soils and he ashed them. So what he essentially did was he harvested the plants and, and combusted them. And then he analysed the, um, the elements that, that were contained with, within them. And what he found was that there are a range of uh, trace elements such as potassium, sodium, magnesium and calcium. However, what he also found was that these types or these trace elements or micronutrients varied according to the soil type. And from these studies, Liebig then came to the conclusion that a range of different trace elements, including those that, that I just said, but also those like ammonia, um, ammonia and phosphate, were really essential in terms of plant growth. And so, again, he tested out this, this theory. He applied... He applied, um, 
He applied salt, inorganic salt, um, in, in, these, in, um, in the soils and again observed their growth. He then also removed some of these, um, some of these inorganic salts. And so what he concluded was that if you removed some of these essential elements or essential micronutrients, plants didn't actually grow. So this then led him to the theory of um, what he was essentially known for, which was Liebig's law of the minimum. What he also found was that by, um, by applying these inorganic salts, as the plants grew, you were effectively replenishing the nutrients that the plants were taking up. So really, this then starts to bring in this idea of, of nutrient cycling and biogeochemical cycling within soils. Plants take up nutrients, but as you harvest them and you take them off site through the form of, of um, crop harvest or, or, or removing pastures through, um, through grazing, then they actually remove the nutrients off site. He actually recognised that you need to replenish those nutrients that were removed in order to maintain soil fertility. And that's when he also started to see, well, maybe we can actually add these back in in the form of inorganic salts or, in, or um, inorganic minerals. And this is where this idea of, of fertilisers and, and fertilisation started, started to take place. So in a series of experiments, he found that the plant's growth could, um, could be stunted if you actually just took away just one, one, of, those, um, just one of those essential micronutrients or, um, or, or, key, or key elements. He showed that the combination of two nutrients, so for example, if you added potassium and calcium into the soil, which were key for, for plant growth, if you took away just one of them, even though the other one was abundant, the plant no longer grew, the plant growth was stunted. And so, um, and this is what we called Liebig's law, law, of the, law of the minimum. However, he had done quite a lot in terms of maintaining soil fertility or trying to understand soil fertility and how to increase nutrient cycling within, within soils. But it wasn't actually all clear sailing. His findings were actually quite controversial at the time and therefore spurned a number of chemists to attempt to repeat some of his experiments. There were two such chemists, or agricultural chemists, who were strongly opposed to, to his ideas at the time. And they were named Laws and Gilbert, and they were based in England um, at the experimental station at, at Rothamsted. Um, so while Liebig actually recognised the importance of nitrogen in soils, he actually thought that plants derived all of their nitrogen from the atmosphere and that there was enough nitrogen in the atmosphere to supply plants with all of their nitrogen requirements. So as a result, he thought, or he regarded, that additional nitrogen fertiliser was superfluous and focused only on, on the trace elements. However, um, he actually... Actually, he, he even um, got to the point where he patented his own compost and manures without the source of nitrogen. However, Laws and Gilbert were absolutely convinced that there was not enough nitrogen in the atmosphere to provide the nitrogen required for, for, plant, for plant growth, well, essentially crop and pasture growth. And so not, applications of nitrogen were really essential and, and absolutely necessary to maintain that, to maintain agricultural productivity. So they tested, these, they tested this theory on a series of experimental plots at Rothamsted, and these plots still exist today. Um, just as an aside, as a soil scientist, Rotham said is kind of like the holy land where you need to make an annual pilgrimage or even sort of a lifetime pilgrimage to, to sort of visit these experimental plots. These plots were set up back, back in the 1800s and, and they, still, they still exist today. So Laws and Gilbert set up these, um, these plots and what ensued was essentially a fiery argument between Laws and Gilbert and, and Liebig through journal pages, so really, really fiery, um, lasting about 30 years, given the, the, length, of, well, the length of time to, to publication back, back in those days. So the other thing was Liebig, through his writings, had actually got himself banned from quite a prestigious journal. Um, and this, this particular journal refused to publish um, his work after, one, too many personal attacks, not only on Laws and Gilbert, but also um, many other agricultural chemists. 
However, it was in this particular journal um, that Laws and Gilbert stated that nitrogenous fertilisers were the most important nutrient for increasing plant growth. And they backed this up with data from some of these Rotham said experiments. And this is still published today. To refute these claims, and Liebig was absolutely adamant that, that he was right, he wrote a 100-page monograph on the principles of agricultural chemistry in, an, in a completely different journal, obviously, because he was banned from publishing in that one. And he wrote it in German, because, because he was German as well. So not to be outdone, Laws and Gilbert then wrote another rebuttal refuting uh, Liebig's claims that particular year, but it was, wasn't actually published until seven years later. So this is how this argument really protracted um, and really grew to, to 30 years. What was actually really quite cheeky and, um, and rubbed salt in the wounds was the fact that Laws and Gilbert also arranged for this article to be translated into German and then disseminated throughout um, Liebig's um, um, networks. Liebig was obviously outraged. And in a private letter to a colleague, he wrote, how ignorant and stupid and devoid of all good sense must be the great mass of agricultural people to allow such a set of swindlers to lead them in all these questions. If you ask any scientific man about the theoretical and practical value of their papers, it is all humbug, most impudent humbug. This is about as fiery as us soul scientists get, really. <laughs> in the end, though, it turned out both groups of scientists were, were kind of right. So, Laws and Gilbert had a series of experiments which showed that if, which showed that plants took up nitrogen from the soil as nitrates and ammonia as you added manure, manures to these experimental plots. But there were a group of plants that actually didn't show any sort of response to, to nitrogen fertilizers. And these were legumes. And we now know that nitrogen is fixed from the atmosphere um, in root nodules of, of leguminous plants. What has what happened? was that Liebig had actually undercalculated or overestimated the, the concentration of nitrogen in, in the atmosphere. And he actually assumed that the nitrogen in the atmosphere was much higher than, um, than, what, is actually the, than what actually occurs. And it wasn't actually enough to, to support plant growth or crop growth. However, on his earlier work, and based on his earlier work on trace elements, Liebig also believed that nitrogen could be supplied in the form of ammonia and recognise the possibility of adding nitrogen in the form of ammonia and, and various ammonia salts um, to, to enhance plant growth. And it's through this discovery or, um, or this reasoning that chemical fertilisers or ammonia fertilisers could enhance crop growth and enhance nitrogen in, in the soils. So whilst Liebig was very strong in terms of his theoretical component, he had, quite, um, he had a number of difficulties in terms of reconciling theory with, um, with practice. And this really reflects the real world of, of agriculture and soil science. And it was much more complex than, than he first realised. But I guess his most important realisation was that soil is only fertile if the nutrients taken up by plants are replaced. And he replaced them with a range of mineral salts or, um, or in the end, inorganic fertilisers. But he wasn't just an agricultural chemist. He also experimented with a range of other agricultural products. So his his influence permeated throughout, um, throughout chemistry. So at the time that he was experimenting with some of these, um, some of these inorganic fertilisers, he was also experimenting with a range of other agricultural products, including boiling down beef extracts to form beef bullion cubes, um, or, and essentially formed or came up with, with beef stock. He actually trademarked the OXO brand um, and founded the Liebig Meat, um, the Liebig Extract of Meat Company, he has also been credited with creating Marmite, although we all know it's, um, Vegemite is a far more superior product. <laughs> but he, he was also a fantastic teacher in, in the sciences. He laid the foundation for the modern laboratory teaching technique or modern laboratory teaching method. He actually required that all of his students conducted actual experiments in the laboratory during their studies. And this is now maintained throughout many branches of, of science today. The end finally came in 1873 for Liebig, and on his deathbed, he actually arranged for his final experiment. He ordered that his coffin, and he ordered his coffin and directed that his body should be packed in charcoal and buried in the Darmstadt where, where he was born. His legacy continues to live on now. 
He has a Liebig Medal named after him by the International Union of Soil Scientists. And this medal is actually awarded for, um, for applied research in, in soil science. So um, his, his influence permeates not only through, through chemistry, but also through soil science and, and soil chemistry today. Thank you.